It's late December 1944. Budapest has been encircled and furious fighting has begun as the Red Army begins its assault. Determined not to abandon the city, the German High Command dispatches the 4th SS Panzer Corps, the last major armoured reserve on the Eastern Front, to prepare an attack that might break the siege of Buda for good. In this final video on the Siege of Budapest, we're looking at the fighting west of the Danube in Buda, and the multiple attempts that were made to relieve the garrison there. The first attacks into the perimeter west of the Danube came on December 26th, even as the Axis line in Buda was still solidifying. The recent transfer of the 8th SS Cavalry Division bulked up the defence here, and German troops were supported by a variety of Hungarian scratch units, including a University Assault Battalion. A raid against them were four Soviet Army Corps and additional supporting units, including the 83rd Marine Brigade. They were under the command of Marshal Fyodor Tolbukhin, who led all Soviet units west of the river. The Buda perimeter was much smaller than across the Danube in Pest, and initial Soviet attacks brought them close to the river by December 28th. By the end of the year, 83rd Marine Brigade had pushed north as far as the Lagimanios railway embankment. The start of 1945 provided no initial let-up, welcomed as it was by sharp attacks towards Sos Hill in the southeast and Matthias Hill in the northwest. Just as the offensives got going though, Tolbukhin withdrew the 2nd Mechanized Guard Corps and the 86th and 49th Guard Divisions from the Buda Front. Senior officers were scrambling to address a developing German relief effort to the west of the city. On Christmas Eve 1944, Hitler ordered the 4th SS Panzer Corps and 117th Infantry Division to Hungary for Operation Conrad, the relief of Budapest. Led by SS General Otto Gieler with 200 tanks and 60,000 men, it was one of the biggest strategic reserves the Germans possessed. As Western Hungary was Germany's last remaining source of oil, the German leader was prepared to prioritise the area even over holding a stronger line in Poland against the imminent Soviet offensive there. By the start of the new year, about half of the German relief forces had arrived northwest of Buda. On January 6th, the 3rd and 5th SS Panzer Divisions launched a rapid offensive east from Komarum, while the 96th Infantry Division crossed the Danube at Suta. The Panzers initially made quick progress, taking Estagom on January 8th. But thereafter, the attack bogged down, thanks to the terrain and a large number of formations that Tolbukhin had kept in reserve to deal with exactly these kinds of attacks. To make matters worse, simultaneously the Soviet 6th Army attacked north of the Danube, pushing west as German panzers pushed east on the other side of the river. Within a few days, this offensive threatened the staging point for the ongoing relief efforts. Luckily for the Germans, reinforcements were continuing to arrive in the area, and the 20th Panzer Division led a counter-attack south on January 10th, containing the situation. With the relief effort halted, the German High Command mounted an exploratory offensive to the south, which was further away from Budapest but in easier terrain to navigate. The 3rd Panzer Corps pushed east to Zamoy before having its advance checked in costly tank battles by the Soviet 7th Mechanized Corps. General Gila, meanwhile, was determined to restart the offensive in the hills northwest of Budapest. There was pressure from Berlin to shift fully to the south, but the commander of the 4th SS Panzer Corps did not want to lose face and pull back his men. The attack resumed, with the 711th Infantry Division capturing Dobogorka on January 10th. The 5th SS Panzer, spearheading the advance, was just 17 kilometres from the city by January 12th, but progress again appeared slow. At this stage, the Soviets decided that it would actually be a good idea to encourage a breakout. It would deliver Budapest to the Red Army sooner and get Stalin off the senior officers' backs. A small stretch of the line encircling Buda was thinned, but the Germans didn't take the bait. Hitler forbade any breakout and ordered General Gieler to break off his attack and redeploy south. On January 17th, as the final attacks in Pest were raging, the entire 4th SS Panzer Corps was moved to the southern salient in secret. They attacked early the following day, taking the 4th Guard Army by surprise and crushing the counter-attacking 7th Mechanized Corps. The advancing panzers swept all away in front of them, 
encircling Zakelishvihirval and reaching the Danube on January 19th. Four Soviet corps were separated from the bulk of Tolbukhin's troops. By January 24th, the 3rd SS Panzer Division had reached Spolachka. By now, there was serious discussion amongst the Soviets that an evacuation south of the city should be carried out, but Tolbukhin opted to try and hold. Counterattacks began on January 28th from the north and south. The Germans destroyed 122 Soviet tanks on the first day, but were forced back nonetheless, all the way to their starting positions by the beginning of February. Operation Conrad had failed, and there would be no relief for the garrison still fighting away in Buda. In Buda, by the time Pest fell on January 18th, the Axis held a front line running from Mathias Hill in the north, through Varos Mayor, to the Lagomanios railway embankment in the south, with some new reinforcements arriving from the east side of the river. With Soviet shelling dropping off in the southern sectors, General Karl von Pfeffer Wildenbruck took the opportunity to consolidate and reinforce. In the north, an anti tank battalion from the 12th Hungarian Reserve Division was deployed to combat a Soviet attack on Market Island. Overnight, on the 24th, the Soviets secured part of Varos Mayor but were halted at Java Street. In the south, the next day, the Red Army began to encircle Sos Hill from the west. The hill was the linchpin of the Axis defence in the southwest of the perimeter, and if it fell, Soviet artillery would have a clear line of fire directly onto the castle district and the German HQ. The German and Hungarian defence was beginning to become ragged, with supplies low and reinforcements not coming. On January 27th, as confirmation of the defeat of the relief effort was received, things started to go downhill fast for Wildenbruck's troops. Both Ferenc and Kisvab hills fell to the Soviets, fatally undermining the student defenders of Varos Mayor, who by this stage had lost 70% of their strength. The front line here was pushed east, to Delhi Station and the Virmezu Meadow, the last area where gliders carrying supplies could land. It was the same picture further north. The Feldhenhalle and 13th Panzer Division, both formations evacuated from Pest, were forced back to Marzibani Square. On January 29th, a counter-attack on the Soviets was scraped together. The Hungarian 10th Division and 13th Panzer were supported by 200 high school pupils who had been recruited two days earlier and given a gun. The attack quickly failed amid horrific casualties for the untrained, poorly equipped schoolchildren. The entire defending force was now in full retreat, desperate to prevent the Soviets from slicing the perimeter in two. Margaret Island was abandoned on January 30th, and the Soviets reached Zena Square, a stone's throw from Wildenbruck's HQ in the castle. At the start of February, the attackers switched emphasis to the southwest, bringing huge pressure on Sos Hill. On February 2nd, the hill was briefly overrun before being recovered by the defenders. The next day, Wildenbruck asked his high command whether there were still plans for relief, hoping to be allowed to break out. He was told to hold until the end. A further request to break out on February 5th was also refused. The situation was getting worse by the hour. Sos Hill was now encircled and Delhi Station was under heavy attack. The end game for Wildenbruck's defence of Budapest came on February 6th, when the troops encircled on Sos Hill surrendered. Almost immediately, the Soviets began bombarding the Axis positions linking the castle district with the citadel on Gellert Hill, close to the Danube. By the end of the following day, most of Delhi Station had fallen to the Red Army, and on February 9th, Gellert Hill came under relentless ground assault, led by the 25th Guard Rifle Division and Hungarian volunteer units fighting on the Soviet side. Attila Street, right outside the castle gates, was briefly overrun, and Soviet armoured cars seized Obrentai Square, cutting the citadel off from the castle. It was clear now that the defenders did not have long left. If there was going to be a breakout, now was the time. Plans for a breakout had been made several times before February, but permission had always been refused. General Wildenbruck thought it was what they should be doing, and it's possible that such an operation would have succeeded during the relief efforts in mid-January, but Wildenbruck had never been willing to defy Hitler. By February 11th though, the choice was either death, captivity, or a breakout. At 5.50pm, Wildenbruck signalled his intention to break out to Army Group South, and then ordered the radio sets to be destroyed both to prevent them falling into enemy hands and also to stop any reply being received from his higher command. The main thrust of the breakout was to begin at nightfall, with the aim of attacking along a one-kilometre front in three waves, 
First would come the 13th Panzer and 8th SS Cavalry, behind them the Feldherrnhaler and remnants of the 22nd SS Cavalry Division, and finally the walking wounded, baggage train and civilians. Some troops had begun to delude themselves at the prospect of success. One Arrow Cross officer was overheard telling his men, the relief units are at Budokesi, the breakout will be child's play. In Transdanubia we'll have a rest and be given the new miracle weapons. I guarantee that in three weeks there wouldn't be one Russian soldier in the country. The breakout began at 8pm. Huge crowds had gathered, clogging the streets and preventing many troops in the first wave from getting to the front. The attack immediately descended into chaos for both sides. On one street the advance might be cut down by Soviet fire, while on the next a group might slip through unnoticed. General Gerhard Schmidhuber, who had survived the fall of Pest, was one of the first casualties, killed in Zena Square early on. General Wildenbruck and other personnel from the castle made their escape through the sewers, emerging on Budokesi Street to be almost immediately captured by the Soviets. Groups of Germans and Hungarians scattered west of the city, each trying to make their own way to friendly lines. The vast majority didn't make it. Of 28,000 soldiers who took part in the breakout, just 700 reached German lines. Some would hide out in forests well into the spring and summer of 1945 before emerging. According to Christian Ngvari, the breakout of the Buda garrison was one of the most futile enterprises of the Second World War. After the breakout, Soviet troops mopped up the last few pockets of resistance from those that stayed behind, and within a few days the city had finally fallen. From the first Soviet tanks appearing on the outskirts of Budapest to its final defeat, 102 days passed. It was the fourth longest Eastern Front siege and the longest of any European capital. It was fought continuously over the heads of 800,000 civilians, none of whom were evacuated. Every other casualty on the defending side was a civilian. Around 15,000 of these were Jews murdered openly in the streets by Arrow Cross thugs with the viciousness that according to Christian Ngvani was unparalleled anywhere else in Nazi-occupied Europe. From the Arrow Cross seizure of power in October 1944 to the end of the siege, the Jewish population in Budapest fell by 105,453. Over the course of the Budapest campaign from November to February, the Soviets lost 240,000 troops including 80,000 dead. The fighting in the city centre was vicious, street to street and hand to hand fighting. Budapest's resistance had tied up at least 20 Soviet divisions and totally derailed Stalin's plans to reach Vienna by the end of 1944. Instead, Axis troops still held positions well inside Hungary that would be used to launch one last offensive in March, Operation Spring Awakening. As for Budapest, after the war was finished, the suffering of the Hungarian population was not. The Arrow Cross regime would be replaced just a few years later by the dictatorship of Matthias Rákosi, leading inexorably to the 1956 Hungarian Revolution. But that's a story for a different video. Thank you for watching this series on the Siege of Budapest. If you'd like to know more about the battle and have a snazzy visual representation of it on your wall, then you should check out this historograph poster for sale over on Teespring. It's filled with detailed information about the siege, the relief efforts and the attempted last ditch breakout and would look great on any history lover's wall. Thanks as well to my patrons for their continuing support, without them these videos simply would not exist.